Hello, and welcome back to the Poetry Podcast with me, Lance Pearson. Program 6. This is the first of our request programs where I respond to a request sent in by a listener. The first request we've received is for one of the most famous poems in the language, Alfred Lord Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade. He wrote this in his role as Poet Laureate of the United Kingdom, and it seems a good idea to look at two later Laureate poems as well and see how the concept has evolved over time. The idea started in England with King James I giving Ben Jonson a pension in 1616. But the post was officially formed in 1668, when Charles II appointed John Dryden. Today, the monarch appoints the laureate on the advice of the Prime Minister. There are no specific duties, but until recently the idea was to write verse for significant national occasions. Some good poets have found their way to the post, and some rather less good ones. Alfred Tennyson was definitely one of the better ones. He is the longest-serving laureate in post for 42 years, from 1850 till his death, a large part of Queen Victoria's reign. He made the position his own so successfully that he was ennobled, becoming the first Baron Tennyson in 1884, thereafter known as Alfred Lord Tennyson. And when he died, the post was left vacant for four years as a mark of respect. That's the only gap in succession from Dryden till now. We've put a list of all the laureates on our website, the Poetry Podcast with LancePearson.com. The Charge of the Light Brigade is clearly Tennyson's most famous laureate poem, immensely popular then and ever since. It has defined the national perception of the incident it commemorates, turning a shambolic military disaster into a glittering example of heroism. It happened in 1854, part of the Battle of Balaclava in the Crimean War. Because of a miscommunication in the chain of command, the Light Cavalry Brigade was ordered to charge a battery of Russian guns, which they had no hope of capturing, and they had to retreat with appalling loss of life. Tennyson had by now moved to live on the Isle of Wight, to get away from insanitary conditions and the endless stream of visitors in London. Living on an offshore island perhaps gave him a sense of independence in commenting on national events. He read the report in the Times newspaper, which included the sentence, The British soldier will do his duty, even to certain death, and is not paralysed by the feeling that he is the victim of some hideous blunder. Those last words, some hideous blunder, became the seed of the poem. Every day Tennyson walked up the hill beside his house, the hill now known as Tennyson Down. And that day the poem took shape in his mind, round the words, Someone had blundered. As he stumped along, the rhyming words, Thundered, wondered, six hundred, came to him, as did the rhythm of the horse's charge. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death, rode the six hundred. Forward the light brigade! Charge for the guns! he said. Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Forward the light brigade! Was there a man dismayed? Not, though the soldier knew someone had blundered. Theirs, not to make reply. Theirs, not to reason why. Theirs, but to do and die. 
Into the valley of death rode the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon in front of them volleyed and thundered. Stormed at with shot and shell, boldly they rode and well into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there, charging an army, while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke, Cossack and Russian reeled from the sabre stroke, shattered and sundered. Then they rode back, but not, not the six hundred. Cannon to right of them, cannon to left of them, cannon behind them, Volleyed and thundered, stormed at with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of six hundred. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered. Honour. The charge they made. Honour the light brigade. Noble six hundred. From the nineteenth century Tennyson, we turn to the twentieth century John Betjeman. Being a hugely popular, best-selling poet, and a favourite of Prince Charles, he was almost bound to be Poet Laureate eventually. And sure enough, in 1972, Sir John Betjeman, as he had become, was appointed. He was now aged 66, past his best, past most people's retiring age, but that was the old Poet Laureate system, a job for life, which you only acquired when your senior colleague passed on. The Times recently did an article grading Poet Laureates on their performance. Tennyson got A star, and Betjeman got an A. He set a trend, continued to today, for being a national ambassador for poetry with special programmes on TV and radio. And the trouble he took was legendary, with the thousands of letters that poured in from would-be poets wanting his comments on their work. But writing for state occasions did not come easy. The first one he was expected to write for was the wedding of Princess Anne to Captain Mark Phillips on the 14th of November, 1973, which was the title he gave to the poem. He found the assignment terrifying and wrote it on the train, fortified by four double whiskies. And the eventual poem was much criticised. He later polished it up a bit, and I think it's wonderful. As Sir John said himself, perhaps the critics would have preferred something horsey for Princess Anne, like, uh, Thou art the spirit of equestrian pride, thou ridest gracefully through the countryside. Instead, he wrote what he wanted to be like an impressionist painting, 
It is short, but captures the scene perfectly. And the emotions. In contrast to Tennyson's high Victorian majesty, this is one of the most delicately fragile wedding poems in the language. But how apt for a vulnerable marriage that the sensitive John Betjeman could perhaps feel was not on the surest foundations. Hundreds of birds in the air and millions of leaves on the pavement, and Westminster bells ringing on to palace and people outside, and all for the words, I will, to love's most willing enslavement. All of our people rejoice with venturous bridegroom and bride. Trumpets blare at the entrance, multitudes crane and sway. Glow, white lily in London, you are high in our hearts today. From John Betjeman, we move almost up to date with Carol Ann Duffy. She benefited from the new Poet Laureate system. John Betjeman was followed by Ted Hughes again till he died. But then the system changed for the 21st century to appointing someone mid-career, still at the height of their powers, for a 10-year period. They're free to make what they want of the job, advancing the cause of poetry, without feeling the obligation to write any laureate poems if they don't feel inspired. Suffice it to say that the two laureates since then certainly have written laureate poems on themes of national but not necessarily royal interest. Andrew Motion was the first, and then Carol Ann Duffy from 2009 till 2019, when Simon Armitage took over. Carol Ann was the first woman laureate. Almost immediately on appointment, she was commissioned by the BBC to mark the deaths of two World War I veterans, Henry Allingham and Harry Patch, both over a hundred years old. She read her poem on the Today programme on the day of Allingham's funeral. It works on three ideas. The main idea is a subtle shift from Tennyson's celebration of the Light Brigade's glorious achievement. Duffy wishes we could rewind the film and bring all those young victims back to life and avoid the war altogether. Betjeman's poem was like a painting. Duffy's is a film rolled backwards. But, second idea, she also pays tribute to the great war poet Wilfred Owen, who died in the First World War. She quotes from his poem, Dulce et decorum est. This is a Latin motto over the chapel door at the officer training college at Sandhurst. It means, it is a sweet and fitting thing, pro patria mori, to die for your country. Owen questions the truth of that in his poem, and Duffy starts hers with his grisly lines about a soldier dying in agony because he doesn't get his gas mask on in time. Finally, third idea, she calls the poem Last Post, which is the military bugle call sounded at funerals, 
or ceremonies commemorating those killed in war. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If poetry could tell it backwards, true. Begin that moment shrapnel scythed you to the stinking mud. But you get up, amazed. Watch bled bad blood run upwards from the slime into its wounds. See lines and lines of British boys rewind back to their trenches. Kiss the photographs from home. Mothers, sweethearts, sisters, younger brothers not entering the story now to die and die and die. Dulce? No. Decorum? No. Pro patria mori. You walk away. You walk away. Drop your gun, fixed bayonet. Like all your mates do, too. Harry, Tommy, Wilfred, Edward, Bert. And light a cigarette. There's coffee in the square, warm French bread, and all those thousands dead are shaking dried mud from their hair and queuing up for home. Freshly alive, a lad plays Tipperary to the crowd, released from history. The glistening healthy horses, fit for heroes, Kings, you lean against a wall, your several million lives still possible and crammed with love, work, children, talent, English beer, good food. You see the poet. Tuck away his pocket book and smile. If poetry could truly tell it backwards, then it would. Well, that's all for now, folks. If you've a request for a poem you'd like me to read, please leave a comment at the website or on our YouTube page. Next time, we're going back in history to before even the first Poet Laureate, to a group of poets who are among the best in the English language.